questions? Do you guys have some stuff that you want to talk about? Mia, is that a hand? Okay. Three point eight, number nineteen. Absolutely. I have a question. Yeah. When you asked us to do put two over where you have the three and five, was that from like the examples you put on the example? Like no, that was homework problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you did something else, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. You probably would have been pretty like, ooh, those are, uh, that's kind of complicated, what's going on. But that's, that's okay. All right. So this says if $3,000 is invested at 5% interest, find the value of the investment at the end of five years if the interest is compounded annually, semi-annually, monthly, weekly, daily, continuously. Okay, so our um, do you remember the uh, the compound interest formula? No. Okay, so I think we used like future value equals present value plus one over. I n to the n t or f v equals p v e to the r t. Um, except let's make that i t because it's really the same i. So the I is your interest rate as a decimal. Um, PV is present value. N is the number of compounds per year. So annually is one compound. And it says we're doing this for five years. Semi-annually would be two, monthly is 12, weekly is 52, daily, we're going to assume it's a non-leap year, so we'll go 365, continuously is infinite, so the continuous one we're going to use the alternate version but that's just the gist of it then we just keep on uh, filling in and updating our formula with the new ends is that cool Mia yeah. no. and then you know all the way down to the last one where we're using now the E version. So if we look at this piece, remember that the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n is equal to E. That's basically what we have there. That's why it turns into an E there. So that's, that's basically why it changed. So for continuous compounds, that's an infinite number. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the last one where it's compounded continuously. Do we switch? Um, and then part B says A of T is the amount of the investment time for the case of continuously compounding interest. Write a Differential equation with initial conditions satisfied by A of T. What is it asking for here? It is the amount of the investment at time T. Okay. 
write a differential equation where the initial condition is satisfied by a of t. I'm not even really sure what it's asking for here. It's too early. I'm too flustered. Everything's run terribly behind schedule for me today. Let's look. Let's look at what they thought this was supposed to, or what, what the back of the book did here. To be honest with you, Mia, this sounds like a question where I read the first part A and I didn't really read part B. Because <laughs> I don't, don't know that I would have assigned this otherwise. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. So here's, here's the deal. Um, so this is going to be of the form like, all right, let me, let me actually back up a step. So you remember how this was the form where we had our differential equation, right? If we go back to the notes from um, 3, 8. So it had like, if you had a differential equation in this form, then we could write it, answer that way. So that that's all I'm starting with, okay? Because I'm just starting in this form. So in our case, the Y is cap A, that's the amount of money. And how much is that changing in an instant? The interest rate, right? So this would just be 0 0.05, where our initial condition at A0 is 3,000. That's all it was asking for. Dirt to dirt, Mr. Kulik. Maybe I did read that, and it was apparent after I had read the chapter, or read the section, what was going on, and it's like, oh, yeah, that should be obvious. And then in two weeks later, when I'm actually teaching it, it's like, oh, that wasn't obvious anymore. So, yes? This is R times Y. Y is. R times Y. That's a K. But that's either way. Okay, so, what is that? So what, what we had said yesterday, where the calculus comes in, if we have a differential equation of this form, where the change in y over the change in t is some linear function of y. So k is just some constant. So it's like 2x or 3.5x, or it's just some linear function. Then we can write the solution to that differential equation as this an equation in that form, which is what we have with the continuously compounding interest, right? Is our continuously compounding interest formula looks exactly like this. So all we're saying then is, well, in my continuously compounding interest formula, the K was where the interest rate goes, so that's the K there. And that's, I'm, I'm basically done, you know what I mean? It's just like some notation stuff, is all this really is. What we wrote. You'd write these two things. You'd have, that's the differential equation. DA, DT equals 0.05A. And you'd say the initial condition is at time zero, A is 3,000. Right? Because what it asked for here was write a differential equation and an initial condition satisfied by A of T, right? So we need to write DA DT equals something. In this case, it's going to be KA. Yeah, it's my projector making that terrible noise. No, it's you're not hearing things. That's, that's real. It's, it's been going on for 24 hours. It's 
solely driving me insane. I think it's the universe trying to punish me for something. I can't figure out what, though. There is nothing to punish me for this universe. I think, like, what? I, I sent a message yesterday, and they came in, and Mr. Kanja listened to it and went, huh, and then left. <laughs> so, I don't know if it, they, they got a plan on fi how to fix that. Sounds like a fan to me. Because I don't know what other moving part is going to be in a projector to be making that noise. Um, anyways. I know. Who's next? Taylor. Um, can we look at 3.8 number 3, um, specifically for 3.8 number 3? Sure. Let me just condense that down a little bit, find a spot. All right. Uh, a bacteria culture initially contains 100 cells and grows at a rate proportional to its size. So like we're saying dp dt is equal to, you know, kp. That's what it's basically saying. Where p of 0 is 100. Because we have this, we can write p of t equals p of 0 times e to the kt. Um, so it says write an expression for the number of bacteria after t hours. It's basically this. We just have to fill in the values of p of 0 and k. Well, p of 0 we know already is 100. To fill in k, we're going to do this. After an hour, the population is 4, 000, or 420. Okay, with that. So I'll divide by 100, and then take the natural log of both sides. There's my value for k. So we can say then p of t is equal to 100 e to the ln 42 t. Everybody okay there? Oh, this should be 4.2, right, Mr. Kulik? If I divide 420 by 100. And notice I have e to the ln, right? I could simplify that if I cared to. And that just becomes 4.2 to the t. But this is okay, still. That's not wrong. Taylor, you okay? Um, so when you find the k, you don't keep the k in the exponent. You bring it down next to the initial Uh, No, I plugged it in to where k was in the formula. So, and then because it's... So this I thought of as like that because multiplication in the exponent is an exponent of the exponent. Those guys canceled, and I have 4.2 to the t. So the equation then wouldn't be like 100 e, and then if you find... You, you can write it that way. It's not wrong to do it. I'm just show, pointing out to you that like you could, you could have simplified it to write it this way. So I can keep it as... Yes. Okay. E to the decimal times T. Yes. That's okay. okay. Not wrong. All right. Not wrong. Okay. I was just pointing out because if this is a multiple choice question where yeah. the way they would represent the answer, I'm almost certain would be 4.2 to the T. Because that's the kind of sneaky move that 
people make in a multiple choice question is they're going to simplify it the really the nicest way possible. All right. Then in part B, we say to find the number of bacteria after three hours. Well, that's really easy. Right, whatever that comes out to be, that's just plug it into your calculator then, right? You go to that, Tay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, C says find the rate of growth after three hours. So the rate of growth is the derivative, right? That's dp dt. So you could take the equation that you found in part A, differentiate with respect to t, and then plug in 3. Or you can note that this is the same thing as k times p of 3. And that makes a lot more sense to me because I already have k and I already have my answer for p of 3. Now, is it wrong to take the derivative of the equation you got in part A and then plug 3 in? No. Are you going to get the exact same thing? Yes. But the sequencing of these questions makes me believe that this is the way they had intended on you doing that. Is that okay with everybody? Taylor? Yeah. Yeah? Um, and then D is when will the population reach 10,000? So that's just solving that equation for T. So I took this equation, right? So I just took my answer from part B, which was P of 3, and my value for K, which I found there, and that'll give it, give it to me without having to actually do the derivative. You know what I mean? So is it wrong if I took the derivative of the equation I got in part A and then plug 3 in? No, absolutely not. That works. It's fine. In fact, it's not even very slow because the derivative there is pretty easy to do. But this is, I think, what they intended on you doing when they when I read the sequencing of these the way they ask the questions. This is what I would inter int I think they intended on you to do. But if you didn't and you still if you did that what we described before, it's fine. Taylor. When you do these, is it okay to round, or would you suggest not rounding? Because rounding in this one specifically made a mess of it. Yeah. yeah. So, shame is the answer, like, so longer. I would say in general, um, when I'm doing a pro any problems, I if I don't have to, like I'll round like I'll write a rounded answer on my piece of paper. But if I'm using the numbers from my calculator, I'm gonna just like, you know, do nine times, and then I'll just take the previous entry and do that. And just like I'm keeping all the decimal places as I'm working on my calculator as much as I can, particularly for like anything exponential. Okay. Because little changes in an exponent make a big difference. I was doing what I was doing. And I was doing, like, for number five, you know what I was doing? Like, I was getting like 100 off every time. And I'm like, I was trying to figure out what I was doing. Probably rounding. Probably rounding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In general, I, I would try to keep keep things exact as much as you can. So like I'd rather use the natural log of 4.2 than like whatever decimal that is, although it's not wrong to turn into a decimal. It's, it's the same thing. Um, and even though I write a rounded answer on my paper, even if I'm using the decimal on my calculator, I'm going to be like going back and stealing the whole decimal when I do work on my calculator so that I make sure that I keep things as accurate as I can. Okay. Um, you guys ready to do some more related rate stuff? Oh, Victoria? Sure. That's fine. No, it's okay. It's not a big deal.
We have time. It's okay. Can you do 27? On the same 3.6? Sure. You said 27? All right, so the directions here say to find y prime and y double prime. Nope, I'm sorry, differentiate and find the domain. Sorry. Okay, um, so first things first, let's find the domain of f. Well, I, I mean, I'm just going to do that part first because I don't have to do anything writing down. You know, like, you could do the derivative first, but it's not going to help me with the domain. Um, so if I look at this, there's two places where I have to worry. I have to worry if the denominator becomes zero and if the logarithm is not positive. Everybody agree with that? So the derivative will become zero when the natural log of x minus one is equal to one. Everybody agree with that? That happens with when you take the log of what in this case? The log of the natural log of what is going to equal one? E, right? The natural log of e to the first is just going to be 1. So I know that x cannot equal e plus 1. Because if I plug e plus 1 in for x, and then I subtract 1, I get e. Natural log of e is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Cool with that? Furthermore, I know that x has to be greater than Not zero, because we can't take the logs of negative, so zero minus one would be a negative. Two. Right? Because if I take the natural log of two, oh, I'm sorry, not two, one, my, go my goodness, my goodness, it has to be greater than one, right? 1 minus 1 is 0. Can't take the natural log of 0. Anything less than that is going to be negative. So I know that x has to be greater than 1 and not equal to e plus 1. So like my domain would be 1 to e plus 1 union e plus 1 to positive infinity. Is that feel okay, Victoria? Now, let's do the derivative. If I look at this, this is just going to be stuck doing a quotient rule. I don't see any obvious algebraic shortcutting that I can do through this. Um, I'll check the answer key when we're done to see if there was anything sneaky that they sneaky moves that they pulled, but I nothing obvious jumps out at me. So I'll have the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. Now when I get to oops. That's not right, Mr. Kulik. When I get to the natural log of x minus 1, that's a chain rule. The derivative of the outside will be 1 over the inside, and then I'll have times the derivative of the inside, and then all over the denominator squared.
So let's see if we can do any clever simplifying. Everybody okay here? Um, Just thinking here, I mean, we're going to get rid of the improper, for, or the complex fraction, I suppose. And I guess we can add the x's, but I don't know, past this, if there's anything clever to do. Now, I had some ideas. That's what they have? Oh, lovely. Good. I had some sneaky log stuff. I'm like, well, maybe they did something like this in the beginning and tried to turn this all into one logarithm and then differentiate or something, but didn't like the looks of it. So that, that's the answer then? Cool. Well, that's good. Taylor? I mean, it depends on, like on a test setting, it'll depend on the direction. So it'll either be like a show, and then, yes, it means you need to go all the way to what I tell you to get to, or it's you're done when the calculus is done. And you've seen in the already that like you're going to skip some of both, right? Yeah. So my answer to you is it depends. Right. The nice part is that Mr. Kulix, on the ones where he does expect things really simplified, he's going to phrase it as show, or at least you have the answer, right? So you know, like, am I done? Am I done? Yes, you're done when you get to here. Okay. Victoria, are you happy with what we did there? Great. Sure. Um, let's go and go back to our related rates examples and um, do a couple more of these. Did you guys do three and five? Should we talk about three and five from the textbook? Yeah. Yeah? You spent some time doing that? Let's talk about those at least initially. Yeah, if you spend time working on them, we should talk about them, right? Five was harder. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna put these in with the uh, with the homework stuff rather than in with the three eight or the three nine stuff. Each side of a square is increasing at a rate of 6 centimeters per second. At what rate is the area of the square increasing when the area of the square is 16 centimeters squared? So I know that the area of a square is s squared, right? Everybody's cool? It's okay. Uh, we're told this is the side of the square is increasing at a rate. So that's ds dt.
and it says what rate is the area of the square increasing when the area is 16 centimeters squared. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the calculus. What is the derivative of A with respect to time? It's just d a d t, guys, right? What's the derivative of s squared with respect to time? 2s ds dt. Everybody's cool? Okay. So what we're looking for then is this. Uh, what am I going to use? The area is equal to 16 square centimeters, though. I'm going to use that to get my value for s. So rather, what I'm going to think about that is I'm looking for dA dt when s is equal to 4. And I'm and then at that point I'm done, right? Is that okay? So it looks so easy when Mr. Kulik does that. It should. I've practiced a lot. Right? That's how practice is supposed to work. Done a lot, a lot of practice in my life. All right. A cylindrical tank, so with a radius of five meters, is being filled with water at a rate of three cubic meters per minute. How fast is the height of the water increasing? So if we think about this picture, you know, we have some tank of water, right? The radius is three, and we have some water coming into it. Oh, five, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. And then we're looking for, um, oops. So this is filling up to some level H of water, right? Everybody's okay with this? Are they bad? No, but it's actually good. Oh. It looks just like a bunch of scribbles to me, but thank you. That's very kind. All right. So what equation am I going to want to use here? Volume of a cylinder. Great. So the volume of a cylinder is going to be the area of the base, which is a circle, times the height of the cylinder. And maybe let's, I'm going to put a subscript cylinder there to indicate the difference between the height of the water. Everybody's okay with that? Now in this problem it doesn't really matter, but in future problems that would be something that we'd have to uh, make sure we differentiate there. Now, here's the key observation. If I'm looking at the cylinder formed by the water, what's the radius of this cylinder? Still five, right? The radius in the cylinder is a constant. 
That's important because when we differentiate, we can just pull that out front and we can ignore it. So that's very important observation there. R is a constant. Yes. Oh, why do I have the two there? That's a great question. Thank you. I was probably already starting to do French. <laughs> I don't know. Or it's eight in the morning and I'm flustered and it's just like these are the kinds of stupid mistakes I make. Thank you, Elvis. Yes, 100%. Just pi r squared h. Okay. So, so if this were like a cone instead of a cylinder, where there you'd, well, there the height of the water and the height of the cone, because you're, and then the radius of the cone and the radius of the water are going to be two different things. We will. Yeah, we will. It's no big deal. It just, we just have to take the baby steps to get there, right? It's not the first thing we want to see because it's complicated. But are we going to look at it? Yeah, it's like one of the, it's like the first medium to hard level thing that we'll look at for the regulated rate. All right. Um, so what do we have here? The water being filled with water at a rate of three cubic meters per minute. What is that? What do we call that a quantity there? dv dt very good and you can tell because the unit is a measure of volume because it's a cubic unit divided by a measure of time right so it is certainly have to be dv dt the units are going to be helpful okay the units tell you a lot everybody okay with that all right, let's differentiate. So the derivative of V with respect to T is just dV dt. Remember, the R is a constant. In fact, if I wanted to, I could call that 5 squared already, if that does it for you. And the derivative of H with respect to T is just going to be th dt. So that's what I'm looking for, is how fast is the height of the water increasing. So I do um, and actually I'm going to go back and abridge something here in just a second, although it doesn't change much. All right, let me do this. Here when I wrote the height of the cylinder, you really should have height of the water there because the height of the cylinder is a constant. The height of the water is a variable that's changing. So really I should have subscripted that as water, not cylinder. That's my mistake, I apologize. You guys see the difference there? The height of the cylinder doesn't change. The cylinder is a cylinder. The height of the water, it's in the shape of a cylinder, that's going to be changing. Yes. Yes. And so what do we get here? We get 3 over 25 pi, whatever that works out to. Well, I just it's plugged in, right? OK. And then it's just calculator time, right? So 0 0.038 centimeters approximately.
I just solve for DHDT, right? So instead of writing as a division with the like the derivative in the numerator, I just wrote it as multiplying by the reciprocal because it felt like it was going to be less messy looking. But you could write it as a division problem. It's fine to do that. Is that okay, guys? That one was a bit, probably a bit harder than the previous one. Mostly, I think, because you had to realize that the radius was a constant. Right? All right, any more questions on these two? Okay, let's go back to here then and take a look at this, example three in section 3.9. It says a tank of water is the shape of an inverted circular cone. Sophia, here it is. We should skip it. You definitely want to see this. It's a good one. Uh, with a base radius of 2 meters and a height of 4 meters. So let's kind of just sketch in a picture. If water is being pumped into the tank at a rate of two cubic meters per minute, There's some good artwork for you. It actually is. Like, I don't know why. It just looks so like, 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 it's, it's, it's minimally detailed. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, okay, find the rate at which the water level is rising when the water is three meters deep. All right, so let's record some of this other information. So the radius for the cone is two meters. The height of the cone is, actually I'm gonna say, I can call this, I'm gonna call it tank. That's probably the better way of phrasing that. What is, Two meters, two cubic meters per minute. Excellent. Will it always be that? Well, I mean, it's a volume divided by time, it should be dv dt, right? And then we're looking for the rate, so it's a derivative at which the water level, so that's dh water dt when the water is three meters deep. Everybody okay with how we've drawn this? Okay, so we're going to be using the volume of a cone to describe the water because that's the part that's changing. The volume of a cone is one-third the area of the base, so pi r squared, 
times the height. Can I just start calling these like RT and RW and HT and HW? I'm going to do that from here on out because it's just going to get a little busy with water and tank down there. Everybody's cool with this though. Yeah. Yes. Three meters. Yeah, water is the subscript. But it's an H, yes. All right. What's the problem if I differentiate right here? Well, nothing is a constant, right? Oh. What the RW and the RHW are things that are both changing as that water increases, right? Because the circle is going to get bigger as you go up the cone. You guys see that? Yeah. Do we know DRW, DT? No, we don't know how the radius is changing with time. It's going to take right? three limits to process the So we don't yet, we don't yet want to differentiate. What we want to find, a, what we want to be able to do is find a way to eliminate the R variable from this equation. Okay? Because if we don't, when we differentiate, we have nothing to fill in for the radius of the water or drw dt, which we'd have to have something to fill in to solve. Like we don't know those things. We can't, we can't do that. So here's the trick. Look at the picture that I've drawn. There's a pair of similar triangles here in the picture. <laughs> so if I look at this triangle and this triangle, those are similar triangles because all the angle measures are identical, right? And this is similar. I know, it's annoying, isn't it? So, why, what does that similar triangles allow me to do? Create a proportion, excellent. The ratio of side lengths in similar triangles are proportional. So I can say that RW over HW is equal to RT over HT. What is this going to allow me to do? I can now solve for RW and write it in terms of all things that I know or a variable that's already in the equation. Everybody okay there? So I'm going to take my RW and replace it with this. Except I'm going to just write this the smart way and just call it that. Everybody cool? 
okay? Notice that the only variable in here now is hw, which is great. Let's simplify that to combine all of the hw's together. So when I take hw over 2 squared, that's going to be hw squared over 4. And if I multiply things all through, I get 1 12th pi hw cubed. And now I'm going to differentiate. So the derivative of v is dv dt. Pi times 1 over 12 is a constant. I'll just pull that out. The derivative of h cubed is going to be 3h dh dt. Yes. 3, 1 third times 1 fourth was the 1 12th. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And now... I have everything I need, right? Because I know the height of the water is three when I care about it. And I know dv dt is two. Let's do that. She lugs the back. So if I, sure. So then to get the dh dw or dhw over dt by its by itself, I'll multiply by the reciprocal. So it's going to give me eight over nine pi. You're okay. So about point two eight. And what unit should we be in? Meters per minute. I know it's meters because the heights were measured in meters. I know it's minute because the rate for my dvdt was per minute. Where did the hw go from the first one? This, we're told, was three in the problem. Oh, and you cancel out of the Yes, I just reduced the fraction there. Yep, exactly. It'll, the reducing, it'll, you'll catch it at the end when you type it all into the calculator. It's fine. Yeah. Not at all. That's fine. You'll get the same result. Mia asks, could I have written like RW over RT equals HW over HT? That's okay too. You could write it that way if you'd like. Right? You could put the you could put the T's on top and the W's on bottom. That's fine. What you can't have is like RW over HT equal, you know, like you have to have something that's common, whether it's the same triangle over the same triangle, same part over same part, or like we did here, like R's over R's, T's, H's over H's, but the things have to line up some, you know, like it has to line up the right ways. You know what I'm saying? But it doesn't matter how you're lining them up. Yeah, of course. 
So when you when you find the derivative, you're not doing any like product rules, any uh we did not need to use a product or chain rule or anything here because all we had to differentiate was h cubed. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, it's about seeing the stuff that you can ignore and seeing the stuff that you can't ignore. And this was a problem where, if, again, if you did not get rid of the R's in the beginning, there's no way to solve it. You had to get rid of those R's in the beginning before you differentiated. All right. Let's do one more example, and then we'll stop for today. Because I think I have one more in here, right? Yeah. I got two more in here. Okay, good. All right says car A is traveling west at 50 miles per hour. Car B is traveling north at 60 miles per hour. Oh, yep, yep. Now I should have read the whole thing. Sorry. Both are headed for the intersection of two roads. So. Okay. Uh, it says, at what rate are the cars approaching each other when car A is 0.3 miles and car B is 0.4 miles from the intersection? So if I look at this picture that we've drawn, hopefully we see a right triangle. So I'm going to call this side x and this side y, and we'll call this dis or this side z. Everybody's okay there. Okay. So what do I have? What is that 50 miles per hour then? about dx dt mm -hmm. and what is the 60 miles per hour then dy dt uh, and then we're asked uh, at what rate are the cars approaching one another what is that asking for dz dt, the only rate left, but it's saying when car A is 0.3 miles and car B is 0.4 miles from the intersection. So what is that? What is 0.3 then? x and 0.4 is y. No, it's asking the rate in which they're closing in. That's the that's how far apart they are, right? So as these get as they're getting closer together, z is getting shorter. That's the rate. So you're looking at how fast they're closing in, right? When they both get to the intersection, z is zero. Yeah. And then they run into each other or whatever. And it's a catastrophic accident. All right, so what equation would I use to describe this situation? Yeah. 
Look at the sh look at the shape. Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I differentiate here, I get 2x dx dt, 2y dy dt, and then 2z dz dt. We have a value for x. We have a value for dx dt. We have a value for y. We have a value for dy dt. We're looking for dz dt. What don't we have, though? A value for z. Can I get that, though? How, how would I get it? Yeah, I can use the values of 0.3 and 0.4 to find z. So note here, guys, two times 0.5 is just one. So I, when I divide one by both sides, I still have just the left-hand side. That's why it just seems like that part disappeared on me. Now, could you have divided it? Sure. But, you know, you don't need to. So I get 78 um, miles per hour, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What would that imply? They're getting further away. What way are they actually going? They should be getting closer together, right? This should be negative. Let's see where we made our mistake. So let's go back and I look at my picture. So this is what I would say. Is that because these guys are getting closer together, those rates should be shrinking, right? Those things should be, that's a shrinking rate. Because we're basically approaching this value that's zero. And the reason I know that is because we, we defined x and y, it's from the intersection. Does that make sense? So that's where, that's where those needed to be negative. And then we're all good. Yep, negative 60 miles per hour, negative 50 miles per hour. So again, notice that we made a little mistake here, right? But, but if you think about it for a minute, about what's really happening, does my answer make sense? It was a recoverable mistake, because all we did was like, oh yeah, those rates are negative. Okay. Or this answer needs to be negative. Where was the mistake? Um, 
we'll do some more with this next time. So I have one more example still to show you guys. It's another right triangle example, but this time we will not be using the Pythagorean theorem to describe it. Oh no. Um, and then we'll spend some time in class having you guys practice some of these guys on your own. Um, and I do want to talk here real quick. Um, I would like to do um, to do a homework quiz on specifically this related rates topic. I want to talk about the format that I'm kind of envisioning so that you guys a know what to expect and b can give me some input about whether this sounds ridiculous or not um so my thought would be with a partner would be you get like you know like two problems, one right is a nine, two right is a 10. And like, you do anything that makes sense is an eight. Um, would kind of be what I would be thinking about. Um, where they'd be like medium-ish difficulty, but the groups may have different problems. I have like a set of six problems that I have set aside for this. So like, I'll be making, you know, I can make a bunch of different subsets of questions and some of the questions are a little bit harder than others. So it's like not everybody's gonna get the same question or all the same difficulty level of questions. Some of them are, there's tough ones and easy ones and whatever's. Um, so that all the same, the same, but I think that like, it's a good representative practice sample. Um, and after the homework quiz, I'll give you guys all the you know, all the questions that everybody had or whatever. But that's kind of what I would be thinking for next week. Does that seem, seems reasonable at least? I think, I think that, I think what I'd like to do like the second part of class on Tuesday, I think is what I would like to try. Um, well, I said Tuesday, but, 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 but again, like you guys come back after trying some more of the homework and maybe you tell me otherwise and that's okay, right? Like Mr. Kulik is perfectly happy to listen, right? So everybody, does that sound, sound okay? Yeah, like not off, not off base in terms of like what's doable or not. Okay, all right, very good. Um, so again, for for the Sunday's homework check, we're looking up through three eight. So three six, three seven, three eight is for Sunday. Three nine not due on Sunday. That'll be part of next week. Okay, everybody's. Three six three seven three eight.